All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is our EY day for Baltimore, Washington and the Pendel conferences. Thanks again for being here. Uh, hopefully you were there last week. I believe it was on Thursday for our uh, our pre-retirement seminar that I and Todd Creveson had with you. Um, if not, you, you're be getting this as a recording. But today is EY's day. And we're going to be having four different sessions today that our uh, wonderful um, presenter from EY is going to be sharing with us today, Catherine Chris Martin. She has been with EY for over 10 years now, but has been presenting this information for more than 20. So, uh, so she's got a lot of knowledge in this area, loves doing what she does. I've listened to her presentation several times, and um, she definitely helps make these difficult concepts a lot more enjoyable and easier to understand. So um, Catherine is going to be starting it off with Social Security and your retirement. So go ahead, take it away, Catherine. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm so glad everybody is able to join us today. Um, these are some pretty important topics. And so one of the things I love to do is share this information with everybody. Now, I've just um, shared the presentation on my screen. Cheryl, are you able to see the presentation now? Yes, definitely. Perfect. All right, mm -hmm. good. That helps. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And the focus of our first session today is Social Security and your retirement. Now, I have been with EY over 10 years, but I've taught these types of financial topics for over 20 years. And I love sharing this information to help you really get kind of in charge of your financial wellness, if you will. So let's go ahead and um, get started. We're going to talk about um, some of the tools and resources first. So let me just go ahead and get started with that. Um, and actually, Catherine, if you don't mind, before we go ahead and get started, um, yes. everyone here who's on the webinar, please to ask your questions via the chat function. Thank um, you. Go ahead and put that out there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did mention that earlier in my intro. I forgot that so, too. So feel free to put those questions in chat once you um you know once you have those, you know, you know, put it put them in there so that Catherine will be able to answer them throughout the presentation. All right. So feel free. All right. All yours, Catherine. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I forgot to say that too, and that's important information. Um, if you have any questions, there's also a Q&A box. Don't use that one. I, I'm, I'm just as not, I'm not as familiar with the Q&A box, so I'd be worried that I might do something wrong on that one, but I'm very familiar with chat. So go ahead and put your questions in chat, and what I'll do is I'll just pause. Um, I won't necessarily go in the second your question is popped up, but I will go in and answer any questions before we finish our session today. So first, before we get started with the topic, I always like to share all of the information um, that you do have access to as a part of this whole program. Um, and so you have information for your West Path benefits and investments. There's that website, there's the benefits access, and there's also the West Path benefits and investments call center. So always keep in mind, you do have these wonderful resources. If you have questions or need assistance with any of your programs, there is a very robust system to be able to help you with any of the questions you have. And then also a part of the overall West Path program are the EY resources, which of course, that's what I'm representing today. And what I'm most familiar with are the EY resources. So the EY resources are not just these types of sessions that you have today. And of course, some of you will also be watching this through a video replay, uh, but you don't all, all only have access to this information. You also have access to our full EY resources. Those include our Navigate Planner Line, the EY Navigate Digital website, and we even have regular monthly webinars through our EY website as well. So lots of different ways for you to really tune in and get assistance in your overall financial planning. If you've never called our planner line, it's completely confidential and unbiased financial guidance. We're open long hours. It's 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And 
we can help you. I mean, it's just as simple as you can make an appointment, talk to a planner, and you can make appointments with the same planner each time. And that's one of the things I love about our services. On average, our planners have about seven years of financial planning experience, and there is no charge for any of the resources that you see on this slide. So most importantly, there's no charge. And you can use the resources on our Navigate website. We have calculators, articles, and short videos. And then every month we have a monthly webinar where we have different topics that might be of interest to you. You can sign up for those. If you attend them live, you can um, ask questions just like you can in today's session. For those of you attending live, you can put questions in the chat box. They'll take those at the end of the session. And those webinars are about a half hour. Um, but one of the things I love about those webinars is that you can also watch the replay on demand. So go to our website, you can go to the webinars, see which ones we've already presented, and then watch those at your convenience. With any of those, if you then have questions, the good news is you can then make an appointment and talk to one of our planners. So lots of ways to get assistance in your overall financial planning. And I just encourage you to utilize it because again, most importantly, all of this is at no charge. It's a part of the West Path program. Um, and then I always have this little chart here, just a reminder of the fact that all of this is only as good as whatever plan you put in place. Um, and one of the things I always keep with me is I keep my own personal notebook. Um, I always have it here because as I'm working, if I get an idea of something I need to do, I'm going to jot that down. I usually give myself a deadline so that I am sure to go ahead and catch up on that later. So create your own personal action plan throughout these different presentations and then get started and working on your overall finances. So what we're going to talk about today, this is social security and your retirement. We're going to look first of all at an overview of the retirement planning process uh, because what we've done is broken it down into six steps of what you need to do if you're planning for retirement. And we're going to focus on um, when we get into the um, how much income you have, we'll be focused in today's session, we focus on Social Security. Now, we also have another session, and we're doing it today as well, called Achieving Financial Wellness. And in that one, we're going to look at these same six retirement steps, but we're going to go through each of the other steps in a little bit more detail. And we'll talk a little bit more about your other resources when we get into the one that's looking at your um, looking at what you have as far as what your resources are currently. Uh, so that's another one you may want to check out. And so today we'll be focusing mostly on Social Security, understanding how that works. And then we also always want to highlight your other planning resources. So let's jump into today's topic again. And that is looking at the retirement planning process, as well as focusing in on Social Security. So what we've tried to do is take what can be a complicated process and, and put it into six steps. So all you need to do is really go step by step by step. Before I started to teach this, I actually started, I thought everything really started with step three. You'll see that one in just a moment. But it turns out there were two steps before that. So we start first with what are your goals? Really, what are your goals? And what will you need to achieve those goals? And the reason we do it that way is because this is your opportunity to figure out what does retirement mean to you? What do you wanna do in retirement? Maybe in your career, you moved around quite a bit and now you just like to relax and enjoy whatever city and place you live in. Or maybe you didn't move around very much and you're like, I really wanna do some traveling. I wanna do some things or I wanna hop in an RV and really explore the US. So whatever it is your plans are or things that you might have thought about for retirement, that's your opportunity to really figure out what you really want to do. And then what do you need? Um, exactly what are you going to need to achieve those goals? Because you might need some extra money in some of those different financial categories where you didn't need them before. Now, here's where I thought the process started. I thought it started with what will you have? I'm going to figure out what I have and then I'm going to live on it. Um, but at some point, you do have to get to what will you have? Um, Compare it to what you needed to figure out, is there a gap? And if so, what should you do about that? And then ultimately, how can you stay on track? Um, so from there, what we look at is some of the things you want to think about as you look into each one of these. So it's not just what are you going to do in retirement? It's also when will you retire? 
What does that timeline look like for you? Is it one year, two years, six years, 10 years, wherever it might be, that would be um, fine. You just want to get an idea of what that timeline is so you can start to work towards that goal. And then figuring out what your retirement goals are. What do you want to do? Are you going to travel? Are you going to just relax and enjoy where you are? Um, maybe you're going to take up some new hobbies. You're going to start uh, golfing or or um, uh, maybe you're going to do, um, let's see, in my community, we actually have a stained glass studio. A lot of people learn how to do stained glass. Um, we have a pottery studio. So people have been taking up pottery, stained glass, golfing, quilting, whatever it is that you might enjoy. Uh, but you just kind of figure out what is it I want to do? How am I going to spend my time? Um, and then from there, you start to look at what will you need. Um, so you're trying to come up with a plan to determine how much you'll need each year. You um, want to keep in mind longevity. How long am I going to live? I want my money to last as long as I do. Um, and then you want to make sure you factor in inflation. I've been talking about this for years, but it's really interesting because in the past two years, people are really paying attention when I talk about inflation. But one of the most important things about inflation is to make sure that you are factoring that into your plan, recognizing that inflation is going to cause some of those goods and services you purchased today to be more expensive in future years. So you just have to factor that in. And then are you gonna have any one-time expenses when you first retire? So we tackle all of that by figuring out really the only thing we know right now, and that is what we have today. So you start with where are you today? And ultimately you're looking overall at your income today and figuring out exactly what that might be, whether it's FICA taxes or if you're in the clergy, instead you'll have the SICA taxes, whatever it is, you're sort of keeping in mind um, what your actual expenditure is right now. Um, and in this case, put it into percentages. So here's my salary and 10% is food, 5% is clothing and so on. So from there, what you do with what you have today is do your best guess at what is it going to be in retirement. So we've already done that for you. Um, and so you can see that I'm saying it's going to be about 85%. And that's called a replacement ratio. It's of the 100% you make today, what percentage of that will you need in retirement? Because a lot of people always have thought, well, I'm going to need 100% in retirement. And it's like, well, maybe not. You think about some of those things that you are paying for today might be going away. So we've shown you an example, those SICA taxes or FICA taxes, if you no longer have earned income, which would be employment or self-employment, then you're not going to be paying that money. And that's a total of 7.65%. It's 1.45% is for Medicare, 6.2% is for social security. And so those taxes go away. And then what were you saving? Well, you can see in my example, I've been saving 8%. So actually it's really 15.65% is going to go away. We just rounded down in this example, but there's 15% I don't have to worry about. Um, and this is kind of assuming I'm living in the same place with the same cost of living, or maybe living in a different place, but again, similar cost of living. You know, if you're thinking of relocating to another state or another city or whatnot, you always have to look at what might happen to my costs. Um, I live in Central Texas, so if I decided in retirement, well, I'm originally from California, from Southern California, but I want more of a city experience. If I decided, you know what, I think I'll move to um, San Francisco guess what? 85% is definitely not a good replacement ratio. If I plan on living in San Francisco, the cost of living is much higher there, especially for housing. Um, if I was going to keep a, a car or anything like that, if I wanted to live in a city area, I might have to pay to put my car in a garage. That could be pretty expensive. So you really want to fit, figure out where am I going to be? And are, is there going to be a big difference in any of my expenses? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but in this case, I'm not doing anything um, different like that. I'm just going to stay put where I am. And you'll see that uh, my transportation commute costs, those are going to go down a little bit. Um, and income taxes, you know, if your income goes down, so do your income taxes. I like to say, the more you make, 
the more the IRS takes. We're in a progressive tax system here. And so that's why we show our income taxes going down. But always keep in mind, you're still going to have to pay taxes on any um, of these funds and taxable resources that you have available to you. Um, and then uh, my housing costs are going to stay about the same. Um, you'll see I increase my entertainment expenses. Now, you can customize this however you want to. When I look at my budget, there's one line for entertainment. There's a separate line for entertainment with family. I like to um, do different things with my kids and grandkids, and I have that as a part of my budget. So when I can, I like to pay for things here and there to kind of help out that younger generation that might not have that same ability. And um, so I have that as a separate line item. And then I have travel in its own category. So um, I like to keep that one separate because I don't want to spend my travel money um, on other entertainment things. Or I might want to, but I want it to be a decision that I make. So the key thing there is figure out where are you today? Do the best you can to kind of get everything down there. And then look to what do you think will continue in retirement? And Overall, kind of figure out what your replacement ratio is. And we have some tools and calculators that can help you on the EY Digital Navigate website. And this is something that our planner line can help you with. So if you want assistance with coming up with that overall plan, our planners can actually help you completely prepare a plan. Now, they'll have to ask you lots of questions, um, but they can help you. And again, as we go through this material, feel free to put any questions that you might have in that chat box and I'll double check and answer any questions you might have. Now, the next important thing you need to do once you determine what you'll need in retirement is to factor in inflation. Um, right now, um, let's assume somebody who's younger, age 28, and they're making about a $50,000 salary. If we assume a 3% inflation rate and they're just buying that same kind of basket of goods and services, by the time they're age 52, that same basket is going to be double. It's going to be $100,000. And then by the time they're 76, it's going to be 200. By the time you're 100, it's 400. So what you're doing is you're factoring in inflation just to make sure whatever it is you're doing with your money will keep pace with inflation. Now, the good news is with the money that you have saved up, in your um, savings plan and uh, any other personal savings you may have, you're still having an opportunity to invest that money so that you're keeping pace somewhat with inflation. So you wanna keep that in mind. Uh, but if you wanna get an idea of how soon something will double, you kind of go back to elementary school if you remember the rule of 72, um, or maybe it was junior high. I don't know, it's been a while for me. I don't really remember exactly when I learned this one. Um, but the rule of 72 basically says, take the number 72, you divide by that percentage rate, that inflation rate, and that will tell you the number of years before the amount doubles. So right now, with an average of 3% inflation, um, the price of goods and services, they're going to double every 24 years. So that'll kind of keep, keep that in mind for you. Then we go on to, of course, how much will you have? And that's where you start to look at what are your retirement resources. So um, when you're doing this, you're really going to look at every one of these different topics, starting with your West Path benefits, looking at your personal resources and any savings you may have, as well as Social Security. But today, we're going to focus in on Social Security. I'm going to grab my little notebook because I just realized I've got an article that came out recently that's talking about the future of social security. So let me get my article. So I'll have it at my fingertips over here. Um, so we're going to talk about social security and really the future of social security. One of the things they do every year is that the actuaries on the social security board of trustees, they go through and they do really complicated calculations to determine the future of social security. Um, and in the Social Security Trustees Report, and this was released um, this year, the, it says that right now they have enough money to last until 2035. Now, once we get to 2035, there's good news and there's not as good news. The good news is they're not completely out of money, but they'll only be able to pay about 73% of the benefits that are promised at that point. So um, that's good news. Um, that 
they have enough money and they'll have enough money um, even past 2035. But for people who haven't started to collect yet, that might be a little bit stressful. And even for those of you who are collecting at that point, it might be a little stressful because where's the rest of that money gonna, going to come from um, if they can only pay about 83%. So the key there is that our lawmakers do need to look at social security and to make some decisions about how they're going to continue to fund that at that 100% level. So what I always tell people at this point is just pay attention because they don't want to uh, make changes that will take away benefits from people who are paying attention and who might vote them out of office. So definitely you'll want to pay attention. Um, and uh, I see I already have a question. How, when and how will I receive my pension? Well, the pension, um, you'll have to uh, elect when you want your pension to start being paid out. Um, if you uh, do attend the Achieving, um, Achieving Financial Wellness presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about the West Path pension plan. But the main thing is you typically need to reach out and make an election to get started with your pension. And you'll have some choices of how to, um, you'll have some choices of how to uh, receive that benefit. So next thing I'd like to show you is um, a little polling question here, but you don't have to answer it. I'll just give you a minute to think about it or a little bit to think about it. And that is what percentage of income does social security replace at your full retirement age for somebody with an estimated annual salary of $63,000. Kind of a specific number, right? So what percentage do you think Social Security is going to replace? I'll give you a second to think about it. The answer on this one is 41%. And that's one of the reasons we talk about Social Security. We want to make people understand or help people understand, not make you. We want to help you understand that Social Security it isn't meant to completely 100% replace what you're making today. And that's why it is important for you to go ahead and put some money aside in your UMPIP or put it in an outside IRA or both because you want that additional money to be able to supplement your retirement income. So you can do some of those things that you were thinking about doing when you did your goal setting. Um, so always keep that in mind. And so here's how Social Security works. We start with a little chart here. And I've, if I've got people who are in the clergy, it works different from people who are in the lay ministry. So we'll look at both of those circumstances. Um, because of the way clergy works in the tax system, um, you're looked at almost as self-employed in some instances compared to just a full-on um, employee. So if you're in the lay portion of the ministry, then you as the participant, you are going to pay 6.2% for social security and the church is paying 6.2%. But for those of you who are clergy, you pay the full amount. You basically pay the employer and the employee amount. It's called the SECA taxes and it's focused on sort of self-employed. And so you'll pay 12.4%. Um, and then... And you'll see the little asterisk there because every year Social Security has a wage base. It goes up to whatever that number is and that number goes up every year. So you only pay the 6.2% or the 12.4% until you get up to that base and then you stop paying that for the rest of that year. For a lot of us, it means you just pay that amount on all dollars because you're not necessarily getting up and over those numbers. Um, but if you did get up and over that with your social security wages, then they would stop taking those amounts. And then for Medicare, it's a sharing system as well for folks who are lay personnel. 1.45% um, goes towards Medicare from that participant and 1.45% from the church. Um, there is an additional amount when you're over the threshold. And there's also a surtax, which will apply to investment income if you talk about very highly compensated people. For those of you who are in the clergy, you're paying 2.9% on all earned income um, and then 1.8% on income over the threshold, as well as that surtax if you have very high investment income, which really brings up the whole question when you go back to 
um, how much you're going to need. It might be a smaller percentage because you're already paying that what 12.4, what are we at? 13, 14, a little over 15% before we even talk about how much you're saving. So you might have a lower replacement ratio uh, because of how that all works out. Um, so that's how they collect the overall um, benefits. And then from there, we look at how um, Social Security is going to do the calculation of your benefits. What they do is it's 90% of the first number. And these numbers are going up every year. So that 1174 um, a couple of years ago, actually last year, it was 1115. And so now it's 1174 because of inflation. So it's 90% of the first $1,174 in earnings, and then 32% of the next amount, and then 15% of anything over that. And, and when we talk about earnings, Social Security calculates your average indexed monthly earnings. What they do is they look at your highest 35 years of earnings. Hold on just a second. I've got a glare coming in here in the morning sun. Um, they take your highest, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me back up. Like I leaned forward and somehow I... Um, Somehow I backed up a couple of slides. All right. So they take your highest 35 years of earnings, your highest 35 years of earnings, and then they bump them up for inflation. And then they come up with your average indexed monthly earnings. So they take your highest 35 years, divide by 35 years times 12, and they come up with your highest earnings. And so in this case, We've done this calculation and this person's average index monthly earnings are $7,200. So it's $7,200. We're going to take 90% of that first $1,174, 32% of the next amount up to the $5,904, and then anything over $7,078. Uh, 7, so it's a kind of a complex calculation, which then comes up with your primary insurance amount. So that's how Social Security is doing those calculations. So they come up with your primary insurance amount. And when you look on the, if you look on the Social Security website, or if you look at the statements that they prepare, that's what they're showing you is your primary insurance amount. And then the question is, what are the benefits that they'll pay? But let me show you first for 2024, what the maximum benefit is, and also what the average benefit is. So the maximum benefit this year is 3822. And that would be somebody who paid all the way up to that, that, that base every single year for all 35 years of their working history. If they paid all the way up to whatever that maximum is, they're going to get that maximum benefit this year of 3822. Uh, the average benefit is 1907. And this is the maximum benefit at full retirement age. A lot of people will take your social security benefits prior to your full retirement age. Now your full retirement age, that gets a little convoluted as well because it used to be everybody's full retirement age was age 65. But back in 1983, they made changes to the social security program and they changed the full retirement age. So now your social security retirement age, it depends on when you were born. It might be 65 if you're older um, or it's uh, 66. If you were born between 43 and 54, your full age is 66. If you were born in between um, that little range there, 1955 through 1959, it's 66 and it goes up in two month increments. It's two months, four months, six months, eight months, or 10 months. And 1960 or later, it's 67. And how this works, I'm just going to focus on that last one, but how it works is you can get 100% of the money at age 67. That's your full retirement age. If you take the money at age 62, you would get 70%. If you wait until age 70, it goes up 8% a year. So you get 124%. So the longer you wait, the more they'll pay you. And it's not just that you take it at these specific times. You can really collect your social security benefit at any time throughout that eight-year period. Starting at age 62 is maximum at age 70 you can choose to collect your social security benefits. So that's something to keep in mind. 
And then um, somebody did ask a question, are social security benefits taxed? And unfortunately, they are still taxed if you are over a certain income level. I'm pretty sure that I have that slide in here. I do. Good. So I'll show you where the taxes will apply for Social Security. Um, I, I always like to say the good news is you get a minimum of 15% of Social Security completely tax free, but they do charge taxes on Social Security. That's another change they made back in 1983. Now, Social Security, it pays worker benefits. That's what we're looking at right here. It also pays spousal benefits. So I've got Dan and Kathy. Dan's the worker. And I'm assuming Dan's Social Security benefit at his full retirement age is $1,000. If Kathy wants to wait and collect a benefit from Dan's Social Security, she could receive 50% of whatever he's getting if she waits to her full retirement age. Now, she could still collect at 62, but the percentage she would collect would be based on what age her full retirement age is. So it's based on Dan's benefit, but Kathy's age. Um, and then in this case, we're showing Kathy was a worker. She has her own Social Security benefit of $400 a month. She could get $500 from Dan's. Kathy will get the greater of the two. So she doesn't get both, but she can get the greater of the two benefits. Um, so that's how the Social Security spouse benefit works. Now, one, one sort of caveat there is that if Kathy was a teacher or worked in a government agency where she didn't pay into Social Security, in which case that might impact her ability to receive spousal benefits. The bottom line is she might not be able to receive spousal benefits. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, Social Security also pays survivor benefits and survivor benefits. It's a one-time lump sum of $255, which this benefit started back in 1935. I actually had somebody who looked at inflation and so on and backed into it and determined that $255 would actually pay for a burial in 1935. It, it definitely won't pay for one in 2024, but it's good to know. But they didn't index that to anything and therefore it stays at 255. Um, and then it will pay survivor's benefits. So if the worker passes away, the spouse can now receive reduced benefits as early as when the survivor reaches 60. They do have to be married for at least nine months prior to the death. And also um, they would receive 100% of the money if they are their full retirement age when they come to collect those benefits. So social security, it pays worker benefits. It also pays um, spouse benefits as well. Um, and it does pay for a divorced spouse. They qualify if they were married for at least 10 years. It pays a spousal benefit for survivor's benefits. It does also pay a spousal benefit when the worker is still alive, just like on the last slide, it does pay um, it to be a divorce benefit. They did have to be married for a minimum of 10 years. Now, Social Security also has an earnings limit. So if you continue to work um, and you take your benefits before your full retirement age, they're going to reduce your money. So for every dollar of earned income, earned income is only employment or self-employment. So it doesn't include money from your pension. It does not include money from your UMPIP, but it is reduced for every dollar or every $2 you make over the limit. This year's limit is 22,340. So once I get to 22,322, they're gonna take back $1 of my social security benefits. Um, and uh, they'll continue to do that if you are making more than that limit. Again, it's if you are um, collecting at the same time, you're still getting earned income. The year you turn your full retirement age, um, it's uh, for every $3, they'll take back $1 and the limit is much higher. But once you are your full retirement age, there's no reduction in your benefits regardless of your earnings. Um, and then one more thing is it is taxed. And here's a little chart showing you the taxation of those benefits. Um, if you are single or if you're married, here are the amounts. The bottom line for most people is they are paying taxes on their social security. Up to 85% is subject to ordinary income taxes. Um, and in order to determine if it's taxable, they look at your preliminary adjusted gross income. They add back in, if you have any tax exempt income, they add that back in and they add in half of your social security benefits. These are all numbers you can find if you look on your 1040 tax form. They're all numbers you can find right there on that form.
just kind of check and see if I had any other questions. Oh, yeah, Cheryl's just reminding everybody, be sure and type, type your questions in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, all right. Oh, and Cheryl did put a comment in the, in the Q&A section. You will receive your Westpath benefits through Westpath, and you can sign up through benefit access.org. So that's a great add-on. Thank you, Cheryl, for uh, putting that out there. It's benefitsaccess.org is where you're going to find a lot of that information related to your pension plan. Uh, security, you can actually sign up on their website and there's great information there, which includes the ability to apply for your benefits, really understand exactly what they'll pay you at different ages and so on. All you need to do is you go to ssa.gov and you'll You'll set up a login and you'll sign in on that website. Um, and that will give you a lot of information about Social Security. They actually create this statement every year. They don't mail them out all the time anymore. They used to, uh, but they will create this statement. And you can even download a copy of the statement. So this sort of shows you a sample statement. They're going to show you here are your benefits at your full retirement age. Here are your benefits at 70. Here are your benefits at age 62. Um, they also show what would happen as far as disability because social security also pays benefits to children. It pays benefits to um, disabled people. So there are a lot of different benefits that do pay out from social security. So it's just a good idea to really keep that in mind. Um, if you have, um, if you have questions about social security, let's see. Oh, Somebody said that the chat was disabled. It shouldn't be. Oh, that's the Q&A is what I'm looking at. All right. Is the housing allowance or reimbursement considered earned income? That is a great question, David. I apologize. I don't remember off the top of my head if it is, but I do know our planner line knows that. One of the things that's really nice, our planner line is able to... Um, help you with a lot of these questions because they're fully trained on all of your benefits through Westpath. And they're very familiar with the housing allowance and the calculations and all of that information. So I would definitely give them a call on the planner line to determine that. Yeah, and I don't know what happened with the chat line. So feel free to go ahead and put questions in Q&A. We'll ignore the chat and we'll just put them in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, Feel free to do that. I can monitor both. So uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box because it seems like the chat one has become disabled. Don't know why. Technology, right? It's our friend. <laughs> now, another part about Social Security. Social Security does the administration for Medicare as well. So we just have a quick slide of helping you understand a little bit about Medicare and how that works. Medicare Part A when you pay your 1.45 or your 2.9%, you're actually paying for Medicare Part A while you're still working. It handles all of your expenses that are hospital relate, related. If, you're, if you are already enrolled in Social Security when you turn 65, um, they will automatically enroll you in Medicare. So if you're already in Social Security, I hope I didn't say automatically enrolled, you're not, you have to apply. But if you enroll in Medicare or Social Security, and you're 65, they'll automatically enroll you in Medicare. Medicare becomes um, effective when you are retired and over age 65. So 65 or older, or you have certain disabilities, Medicare becomes primary when you are retired or um, if you're over 65 or reach 65 or older, and if you have certain disabilities. So there's no separate premium for that benefit. Um, there is a separate premium for Part B, and you need Part B because Part A doesn't pay for the doctors at all. And then Part B pays for the doctors who treat you in the hospital, plus it pays for all of your outpatient care. That's your doctor's coverage. And so you're automatically enrolled in Part A and B unless you decline them. Um, and there's also some other options other than A plus B. Now, A plus B don't cover drugs. So if you are staying in original Medicare and you want prescription drug, outpatient prescription drugs, you do need to choose a Medicare Part D plan and those have a separate premium. Um, so you can keep that in mind. Alternatively, you can look at Medicare Part C plans, also called Medicare Advantage plans, 
Those are nice because they not only provide everything A and B offer, many times they include prescription drug coverage and they include prescription drug coverage at no additional charge a lot of times. So you get additional benefits if you choose a Medicare Part C plan. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea about how Medicare works. The action step here would be visit medicare.gov if you want to learn more about Medicare and how that works. Um, I would definitely wait until you get closer to that age where you're going to need it. Um, there are also Medicare has people who are licensed to help you find um, Medicare plans that might assist you as well. Um, questions, let's see from me, Medicare Advantage plans. Ah, so Amy shared a comment um, saying from being with parishioners, Medicare Advantage plans are lower quality and to get out of them and back into Medicare, some states require a physical. That is a very, um, that's a very good add on, Amy. I appreciate that comment um, because the quality of those plans can differ. So if you want to then get back, you can't actually get back onto A and B. This is true. But what you can't get um, at times is you can't get um, a Medicare supplemental plan without a physical. So I would just add that on. But there's definitely a risk. So you do want to do your homework if you look at Medicare Advantage plans because the quality varies. What they offer really varies because I can sign up for certain Medicare Advantage plans where I'm here, I'm here near Austin. But if I move back to the Houston area where I used to live, none of the plans that are offered in Austin, well, a lot of the plans that are offered in Austin, I wouldn't say none, but a lot of the plans that are offered here, they're tied to local providers and they're not, um, and they're not offered in the Houston area. So I'd have to look at changing plans. So it is important to truly understand what you're doing if you were gonna choose a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and then the other thing to look at as you're doing all of this is to just understand, um, is there a gap? How do your goals and your financial resources and income sources compare? And on our website, if you like to kind of do it yourself, you can go to my goals and finances and use the plan for retirement goal you can put all that information in and basically just look to see, okay, how long will my money last? So we'll help you look at that um, and figure out what you need to do. If you want to work with our planners, they can help you with this as well. Um, and then what should you do if you realize you do need um, to save more for retirement? Really, it's save more, work longer, live on less in retirement, or consider investing for one more year? What if I increase how much I'm saving today and so on? So if you realize you don't have enough, it's looking at any one of these things or a combination of them. If you realize, wow, I'm doing great. I have enough. Also make sure, are your results reasonable? Have you included everything? Don't forget about inflation. Review your assumptions and stress test your results. Do, do what you can to start living on that amount. And then how can you stay on track? What you want to do is implement that savings and investment plan that's going to help you stay on track <clears throat> and then monitor your plan annually or when changes occur. Don't forget about all the different resources that you do have through the West Path program and through your EY resources with the planner line, with our website. We even have an app you can download as well as being able to sign up for different topics and and um, different classes that can really help you uh, improve your financial planning skills. Um, our planner line can help a variety of ways. And on our website, we have tons of calculators and resources, videos, and lots of things that can help you. And we do also have an app. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is maybe take two or three actions as a result of going through our class today. Don't forget, this is going to be recorded so you can go back and you can watch the replay. And then you do have the ability if you'd like to give us some feedback on our session. It's going to need the session number, the uh, workshop ID number. And your workshop ID number is 43787, 43787. I just want to double check. 
to see if we have any other questions. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. So um, we're going to um, go ahead and we'll take a little bit of a break. I went about a minute over. I'm going to start right back up at the top of the hour. Our next topic is going to be dissolve that debt. So this session right here will stay open. We'll move on to the next presentation, but feel free for you to uh, take a break or if this is not a topic you want to um, um, you want to tune into, you can sign off and I'm sure other folks will sign in and join us. So we're going to go on a break now and I'll come back and get started at uh, 10 Central Time, 11 Eastern Time. We're going to talk about dissolve that debt. Thank you. <music> 